the back rooms. You've been here before. Entity number 71, the Red Knight. Habitat, all. Image caption, Entity 71, photograph taken by Emily Langerman after her rescue. Description, the Red Knight is known to nearly everyone in the back rooms. If you haven't met him personally, you've heard about him from someone who has. I'm recording what I know and what I've gathered from others in this document for the sake of posterity and respect, more than actual research. But unfortunately, there's not a lot to write down. You'll know the Red Knight if you see him, because he's a fucking knight. You don't really get a lot of those around here. From what little I can remember from Wikipedia, he's equipped with armor that would have been appropriate for the late 16th century. I'm not sure if that means anything. He's got a sword that's too big to be worn on the hip, so he tends to shoulder carry it. Sometimes he has a shield, and sometimes he doesn't. He wears a red cape with gold trim, which is great for visibility, fortunately for us. All this is in good condition, but you can tell it's old. The armor has some dents in it, and the cape is tattered at the end. He's average height, average fit build. If it weren't for the getup, you probably wouldn't notice him. But I hope you do notice him if he's around, especially if you get lost, or cornered. Considering how long this guy's been around and how much ass he beats, there's no way he's human. It might even be wrong to call him a he at all, but I don't care. He sounded male when he spoke to me. You're probably only reading this because he can cut monsters in half with one swipe of that blade of his, and the whole magic thing. We're not entirely sure how that works, but frankly, we're not sure about anything, are we? Behaviors. Step from the anvil. Our shining servant. Take up your blade. And protect us. A memory given by Lorenzo the Smith. Lorenzo Marquez was saved. A familiar air enters a man's lungs. He does not remember his previous breath. He knows that he is old, but he is not so old that the stream of his memory breaks its banks. Not yet. The man stands from the floor. He remembers lying down, tired, after his 14,000th day at the garage. A man may not remember each one of those 14,000 days, or even the figure itself, but he will remember 40 years. 40 years of metal and grease and love. He has powerful muscles for a man his age. He has a bad heart, but it is a secret. Balance returns to his legs. He checks his body, a reflex from the handful of years he spent as a warrior. No damage, clear head. His fighter's brain was honorably discharged, and is as retired as the rest of him should be. But it still has force of will. It tells him that his environment is unfamiliar, and he must check it next. So he does. A dark space, splintered by spears of light, thrown in between window boards. Old carpet, no furniture, a house, then big and empty, big and empty, nothing moving except him. The metal worker wonders how this could possibly be a dream. He remembers getting in bed, kissing his wife. He had never been in the habit of wearing anything other than underwear to sleep, but he stood fully clad in his work clothes, unfamiliar location. No memory of arrival, wrong clothes, seems like a dream, but it doesn't feel like one. It's true that a man can rarely tell that he is dreaming, when he is dreaming. A rare talent, some quirk of salt and electricity that he had never attained. But he has dreamed in the past, and this does not feel like those did. There's no fog, no fundamental disconnect. No ephemerality of his surroundings, actions, and self. It couldn't be a dream. He pinches himself, almost out of a sense of irony, and it hurts. That settles that then. Only two options from here. Explore the house or go outside. There's no one around, and he isn't being held captive. Though, in an unfamiliar place, 
Without his shoulder holster or his phone, he might as well be. He figures the sensible thing to do is to go outside and try to figure out where he is. At least it's daytime. He puts his hand on the door and opens it without a sound. The smith looks out on a town that he remembers, even though he does not remember it. The sun is bright and shines on a street that is not busy. From his position on the front patio, he can see a drugstore, newspaper stand, butchers, malt shop, hardware store. It's like looking at an old Polaroid, and it starts moving. The wind in the trees and the cheerful jukebox from inside the ice cream place flow all across the distance and wash back and forth in his ears. There's no one around. He knows this place, even though he doesn't know it. He figures he visited here when he was a kid, half a century ago. Or maybe he lived here for a short time, a year or less. Or more, it's hard to recall. He knows he knows it, despite the indisputable fact that he has never been here. His skin feels that it is warm here. His mind feels that it is safe here, even though his brain does not. The mechanic steps off the porch, mindful of his bum knee. On the sidewalk, he looks left and right, down the street, more buildings in either direction. It's all flat, no hills or variations in the land, no mountains or features to the horizon, or none that rise high enough above the one-story rooftops to be visible. The sign says Main Street, but it feels like a suggestion more than a name. There aren't any cars. A voice on his right says, Welcome back, Lorenzo. The old man nearly jumps out of his skin. There's another man standing near him on the sidewalk, younger, maybe in his thirties, white, clean shirt and slacks, smiling. How did he sneak up on him like that? His hearing must have slipped further than he'd thought. The man has no facial features at all, but it doesn't make any difference to Lorenzo. He knows he's seen this man somewhere, a long time ago, immediately familiar. Maybe a friend of dad's, a co-worker? Used to come around the house and have dinner sometimes. Lorenzo can practically smell the tamales with just a glance. That perfect way mom made them. But, no, that's not it. This man is half Lorenzo's age. It must be something else. Been a long time, hasn't it? The man holds out his hand. Lorenzo shakes. No reason to be rude. The stranger's palms are as dry as coffin wood. Not entirely sure of himself, Lorenzo replies, Yeah, it really has been. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to refresh me. Mr. Uh... Name Corrupted. It's Name Corrupted. I really can't blame you for not remembering. It's been ages. Though, in a way, I bet it feels like it was just yesterday, doesn't it? Lorenzo nods, still not on terra firma. Sort of, uh, only I can't, uh... He's not sure how to put this. Can't remember how you got here? That's alright, Lorenzo. There are plenty of other things to remember instead. Like, remember old Mrs. Name Corrupted? How you and little Name Corrupted accidentally threw the ball through her window? How mad she was? And your father made you two go and apologize, but she felt so bad about yelling that she gave you both a slice of apple pie anyway. Lorenzo did not remember this at all, but it was a very fond memory of his. The foibles of youth, getting into trouble, the good old days. You didn't need an Xbox or the fucking internet. You just needed a friend and a ball. That was enough. Mm-hmm. And they're all still here, Lorenzo. They never left. We had a feeling you'd be back one day. Name corrupted, waves an arm. Lorenzo looks behind him, back out into the streets. There are dozens of people now. None of them have any faces, and he recognizes each and every one of them from the sugary, sun-faded days of his childhood. Old Mrs. Name Corrupted, in her cornflower dress, his friend, little Name Corrupted, still eleven years old, and with that spark in his eye, ready to go fishing or climb a tree or anything at all, at a moment's notice. Lorenzo isn't scared that they had appeared from nowhere, or that he had never seen any of them in his life, 
or that he grew up in Michoacan, not America. Why would he be? He is home. Note, see level 200. Home. He turns around again, heart swelling with joy, to look, name corrupted, in the eyes that he does not have. Lorenzo smiles. It's good to be back. The crowd of things all take a step toward him, simultaneously. Forty-six feet all land on the asphalt in the same instant, at some unseen cue. Lorenzo is happy to see all of his old friends and loved ones again. Name Corrupted freezes and angles its head just before eating Lorenzo's brainstem, as though it can see something. Lorenzo turns to look. On the far side of the intersection, a man steps out from what is pretending to be a post office. Lorenzo's eyebrows knit and his head tilts. He's not sure what he's seeing. The things gathered all around him are still, because they are sure what they're seeing. He is totally incongruous to his surroundings, like something out of a storybook, clad head to toe in old armor that gleams in the false desert sun. A torn and faded red cape drifts in the breeze as he walks. Over one shoulder is a huge two-handed sword. The town's beings do not move as the night approaches. He strides to Lorenzo and, name corrupted, the only sound is the clank of his footfalls. Then, silence. The knight stands there, a champion of nothing, the engravings on his plates telling the stories of battles that no living thing can remember. Name corrupted says, You are not welcome here. A voice of any accent replies from the helmet. I don't care. Let him go. No. This isn't a discussion. Release him. To what? He has already fallen in. He is too old to defend himself. Freedom would just delay the inevitable. It is less cruel to allow us our catch now. The knight's right arm hefts the huge sword and aims it at the center of Name Corrupted's chest where a heart would be in a human. I won't tell you thrice, Mayor. I can do this any number of times. I literally have nothing better to do. You can make this easy and go hungry today. I can't be everywhere at once, and there will be other prey. Or, we can repeat the events of the previous moon. I have all the time in the world, and all the other worlds too. I could just sit down right here and make you all my new special project. Hmm? How would that go over with your consultants? A pause. Name Corrupted looks from the knight to Lorenzo to the gathered crowd. Lorenzo is confused but he can tell that Name Corrupted is now very concerned about his chances. The old mechanic knows that body language of someone being backed into a corner. It's dangerous. What does this Renfair guy mean by any of this? Name Corrupted wouldn't hurt anyone. Name Corrupted spits. You're bluffing. You are too idealistic to stay here and watch us. Think of all the other ephemerals being eaten right now. The guilt would kill you, watchdog. You would rust from sweating. Would I? The knight raises his arm and drives his greatsword into the asphalt. It sinks in, as though the poured stone were little more than cake, standing upright. Then he kneels and sits on the ground, his back against the blade, like the rise of a chair. Your patience against mine, then. I'm fairly sure you'll starve before I do and we both know there will likely be an impeachment before that grim eventuality. Name Corrupted looks to his fellows. Lorenzo thinks he wouldn't have to be a political mastermind to feel the change of sentiment in the air. He can see a bead of sweat run down Name Corrupted's neck. Something in the crowd growls. Name Corrupted snarls. All right, fine. Take your burdensome tax and be gone from us, thief. The mayor grips Lorenzo by the forearm and flings him toward the knight. The instant the thing's hand leaves Lorenzo's skin, the sun goes out. The buildings are old, ruined stones. The sky is a dark nothing. The people are writhing things, half shadow, half television static. They watch him go. Lorenzo is not home at all. 
He has no idea where he is. The knight rises to catch Lorenzo and pulls his sword out of the ancient rock in the same motion. He takes the old mechanic by the upper arm and leads him away, toward a small gathering of tall, smooth stones, barely visible in the dark. The only light comes from some unfathomably distant pinpoint high in the sky, reflected by a great water nearby. Lorenzo doesn't know where to begin, so he tries everywhere at once. Ijo di puta? Who are you? What were those things? Where am I? The knight replies in fluent Spanish, which Lorenzo is surprised by, and supremely grateful for in this specific moment. Predators, they use illusions and glamours to lower your guard and soften your mind with nostalgia and peace before eating you, tenderizes the soul. But what? How? I don't know where I am. I know, and I'm not the one to answer your questions. I'm taking you to someone who can. They stop on the far side of the rock formation, and the knight lets go of Lorenzo's arm. He takes a few steps forward, holds his gleaming blade in both hands, spins once, and swings a wild cut that would have bisected a man from hip to collarbone. With nowhere else to sink into, the space gives way instead. A glowing white gash splits the air and stays there. Lorenzo is trying to keep pace, but can only go so far. What is that? The knight says, shortcut. He turns and comes very close to Lorenzo, as though looking him right in the eye. Lorenzo can't see anything through the knight's visor, just darkness. Listen to me, Lorenzo. What I am about to tell you is vitally important. Things far, far more important than your life depend on it. Understand? Lorenzo just nods, scared in the white radiance of the scar in the air. Once you're inside, do not listen to any of the voices you hear. You will hear them, maybe hundreds. Every one of them is lying to you. Ignore them and walk, with your eyes forward. Do not allow them to distract you, and do not stop walking. You will see symbols in the air. Find this one. The knight holds up a hand. Above his palm, a glowing white glyph appears, in the shape of a circle with an equal-armed plus sign, like a crosshair. Once you do, touch it. Do not touch any of the other ones. It is of critical importance that you do not touch any of the other symbols, and that you ignore the voices. Do you understand? Lorenzo can hear sounds coming from the other side of the rocks, but a steel hand lands on his shoulder, and he looks back to the knight. You understand everything that I've told you, Lorenzo. Yes, but... Hmm? I want to go home, sir. The knight sighs. Lorenzo can feel the gauntlet give his shoulder a squeeze. Yeah, me too. The knight picks up the 200-pound grown man and tosses him into the portal like a sack of potatoes. Lorenzo will never go home, but he will go to other places. And on his dying day, he will see the knight again and thank him for giving him the opportunity to see so much. What sets the Red Knight apart from a lot of the ghoulies and ghosties we bump into in this fucked up labyrinth dimension is the fact that he doesn't try to eat your face the moment he sees you. None of us are entirely sure how or why, but the Red Knight seems to show up right around when someone new falls into the back rooms. The running theory is that he has some kind of ESP or magical sense that lets him find people. Or maybe he's in tune with whatever magic or quirk of physics that results in us getting trapped in here in the first place. More on that further down. It's the same story, person after person, hundreds of times now. Poor Billy falls into the back rooms, Billy winds up on 8 or 777 or 200 or something, and some real fucked up shit is about to happen to Billy, real quick. We've all found enough skeletons in here to know how this usually ends up. But, sometimes, the Red Knight finds Billy before he can get his guts thrown everywhere like a ball of yarn. And good for Billy, because the Red Knight generally rescues newcomers, usually by putting himself between the survivor and whatever is trying to eat them, and slashing the things to ribbons. Sometimes he talks to who he rescues, but he's not a great conversationalist. 
For most accounts, he only spends time enough to get the survivor instructions before throwing them into the portal thing he does. Yeah, we're not sure how exactly the Red Knight does this, but he can use his sword to cut open a portal to another level of the back rooms. Again, this story is consistent across hundreds of accounts. You look for the circle with the equal cross arms, you ignore the voices, and walk through the light without stopping. Once you find the symbol and touch it, you get spat out somewhere near where there's other people. Usually this is a mega encampment of some kind, but sometimes people just fall out of a glowing white rip in the air, in front of some expeditionary force. Signed, sealed, and delivered safe. We're assuming that something bad happens to anyone who ignores or disregards his instructions, because there's no one around here who claims to have done it. Other than that, the Red Knight has been known to show up when people are in a bind. Again, we're not sure how he accomplishes this. It's either some kind of omniscience thing, or the universe has some sense of dramatic irony after all. You went down the wrong shaft, you got separated from your crew, your gun jams, your back is against a wall, or you're walking in circles in the dark, about to be someone's lunch, or set to die an agonizing death of dehydration, drinking your own piss for four days until your body gives out, then the Red Knight steps out of a cut in the air, and you find your way back home. We all want to know more about him, why and how he does the things he does, or at least some kind of hint about who he is, but he's not much of a talker, he just sends us on our way. Biology. We're not entirely sure if he has any, biology I mean. These forms are kind of meant for other sorts of stuff. I'm just making do with what's around. I'll just talk about the things I've heard he can do. One thing for sure is that the Red Knight is superhuman, no question. We've seen this guy go toe-to-toe -to -toe with threats both known and unknown, while outnumbered, and still come out on top. He's strong enough to lift and throw a grown man with one arm and swing that great sword like a twig and so fast that some have reported his boots glowing red and kicking up sparks while he fights. Old Maurice said that he saw the Red Knight get backhanded into a stone wall by an ogre. He hit it so hard that he left a man-shaped impression in the stone, but he pried himself out and kept fighting. That said, we don't think he's invincible. There are a few stories of the Red Knight getting into fights that only barely left him time to open his gateway and throw the survivor in with the right instructions and other times where he was really badly messed up by the end of the fight, limping, cradling a broken arm, riddled with dents and holes from spikes or arrows, or whatever he's having to deal with. He must bounce back pretty fast, though, because none of that damage appears to have been permanent. The upshot is that it seems like the Red Knight can be defeated. It's just that no one would have been left alive to recount what they saw. Those sites, we've found some zones, with the sword slashes and signs of a struggle, but no one can remember being there before. Yeah, you're probably thinking what we're thinking. Unlike us, the Red Knight might have some kind of escape clause or immortality or something, because if he has been beaten in the past, he's come back every time. Indomitable Sentinel. Keep watch over us. Stand before our foes. And bear our agonies. A memory torn from Shatalkol, inheritor of rust, never shall he be corroded. The knight leans on his long blade, panting. He is surrounded by the bodies of profane things lying upon the scorched earth. The visceral red sky boils above them, displeased. They are all split slain in battle, their hated foe proven equal to their wrath. There are scores and punctures in his armor. From them, a sacred fluid leaks, indescribable in hue, exquisite in flavor, to those that take pleasure in suffering. The fluid is time, le leaving the night until the great current turns again. The fluid is proof that he has fulfilled his purpose. The night makes a fist, droplets falling from his knuckles, to hiss on the volcanic ground. He must catch his breath. This is new to him. Before him unfurls Shaltokul, a baron of the All Dark, commander of ten hundred thousand fangs. He is the mutant shadow, known in all places as the murderer of light. The prince pours forth from the doorway as a miasma of wings and dust, formless and terrible 
and points down at the little knight. You. The knight raises his head to behold the misery of a hundred worlds and replies to it. Me. Hello again, Sheltakol. How many stars have made their dance in the time since our last meeting, O oh, Iron Savior, O oh, Crimson Defender? How many worlds have bloomed and wilted? The knight begins to count on his fingers for a short moment, but appears to think the better of it. Quite a few, I should say. I was under the impression you had died. Note, see the enigmatic level, the grave. The great sword screeches in its stony recesses. The warrior adjusts his stance, so the gross guard rests securely in his armpit, as a much-needed crutch. You are correct, but it appears to be a pastime to which I am poorly suited. The demon overlord billows indifferently in the sulfur breeze. So I see. I also see that, in the course of your visit here, you have slain a considerable number of my cohort. A lightless wing waves over the field of abhorrent corpses surrounding the exhausted fighter, who looks about at the destruction he has caused. That is true also, sir. May I ask why? Unfortunately, they were insistent in capturing a charge of mine. A charge? Yes, I attempted diplomacy, but I would note that your subordinates are utterly dogged in the pursuit of their goals, a trait that I find admirable, as you may remember. Oh, know it to be true, champion most notable. I have forgotten nothing, nothing at all. Indulge your host this query. What was the nature of this charge of yours? The knight sighs. A human, another lost soul, fallen between the cracks of the cosmic paving stones. She had the poor luck of landing here, in your most considerable house. Your servants moved to attend her in the customary manner, and as you know, I was compelled to intervene. There is a rumbling silence. Ah, Shaltakol kneels. A cascade of burning darkness breaks over the knight's shoulders and floods the earth around him. The sky is gone, only the prince remains, and he speaks with the throat of ruin. So this is your new occupation, the great guardian of the firament who slew the foe of creation and preempted the stagnant age, now spends his retirement plucking worms from the earth. Yes, I suppose that's one way of putting it. We all do what we can, after all. Hmm... For a thing still capable of slaughtering my slaves with steel abandon, it appears you can do very little. Things have changed so in our time apart. Indeed, much has happened. I do so wish that such an irritating setback could have at least been afflicted upon me in the name of something impressive or respectable, rather than the well-being of a single monkey. We all have our wishes, sire. They make us who we are. The shadow about the night boils. The ground begins to corrode and liquefy, returning to a more chaotic state beneath the prince's rage. You appear to wish for oblivion, crumb of the cosmos. It is clear that you howl for the dark. Otherwise, why would you have made such a trespass upon me? Shaltakol, smelter of hope, shadow of shadows. What a shame this is. What a putrescent lament is before me. There was a time when you were our only fear, the one true opponent who could give us uncommon pause. The knight nods in appreciation, his sword slowly sinking into the melting earth. My modesty forbids me from self-praise. Though you are correct, I did kill your parents. The terror of the all-dark ignites and the knight stands unsteadily in the eye of a hurricane of dark acid. The storm erupts to shake the bones of its domain and cry fury. So you did! You slew the greatest of us! You did as your tyrant creators bade you, and cast us down into annihilation! You were the protector, first of knights, 
the grand champion whose blade cuts chaos, whose shield shudders death. And now you are a fragment, a splinter, a broken ring of mail. My father struck you down with his last act and reduced you to a finger of an arm of a body that died eons ago. Once you were Empyrean, now you are erstwhile. Shaltakol exhales his hatred and his kingdom shivers. Darkness is ascendant. So what is your order, Imperator? What command could you presume? How shall I serve thee, corpse of glory? At the center of the inferno, amid the gale of fangs, the knight hauls his tired blade out from the slag and flicks the fluid aside. It can be a crutch no longer. The time for rest has passed, like so much else. The Red Knight, who is a faded impression of what he once was, who commands nothing, gives his order. Defeat yourself. And his battle continues. Discovery. It feels almost ironic writing something about how we discovered the Red Knight. I don't think that's how it worked at all. I'm pretty sure he discovered us. Think about it. You fall into the back rooms at random. You could end up anywhere at all. We've heard all the stories. There are almost as many entry points as there are people. How did a human society even come about in a place like this? There are only, what, a few hundred of us? Maybe a thousand on the outside? How the hell did we ever get any kind of organization at all? Well, I've got a theory. I think the Red Knight did it. I don't know if he did it on purpose, but we all know that he tends to drop you off near other people. And I think that's by design. I think the fact that we even have a human enclave in the middle of all this shit is because of him. I think he wants us to stick together, because he knows better than anyone else that this place wasn't made for us. And we don't stand a fucking chance at all by ourselves. He may not always be around, and we might not always meet him, but he's the closest damn thing we have to a god that this place has. And I think we should all thank our lucky stars that he's here. Where the hell would we be right now if he wasn't? Our glorious creation. Salvation by our own hand. Give yourself to us always. As our eternal sacrifice. A memory given by archivist Langerman. To seek new truths. The knight pulls his blade from the rib cage of the last warp wolf. It gets stuck on the creature's occasionally existent rib cage, so it takes a few tries. This is the ten millionth time that the knight has pulled his weapon from something he has killed, and he knows it. The fact is a part of him, but he doesn't announce it, because he does not see it as a cause for celebration. Emily is trying not to pee her pants. So far, she is successful, which she is pleasantly surprised by. She has never been attacked by so many things at once. People with authority over here have insisted that no one wander far from the settlement boundaries, but Emily has never been the sort of girl to color within the lines. A traveling, exploratory merchant arrived within a few rolls of film from some level or another, and her camera thirsts for images anew. She couldn't help but stray, and it had very nearly cost her her life. As the knight flicks spiraling, shadowy blood from his longsword, Emily manages to force some words out, now that she is no longer being attacked by physics agnostic wolves. Th who are you? The armored man, apparently still dissatisfied, tries to wipe his sword on one of the dead wolves' fur, but it keeps flickering in and out of existence. He replies, Are you hurt? She puts a hand on her chest and huffs a relieved breath. No, somehow. Those things really come out of nowhere, don't they? The knight turns to face her, shouldering his blade. Yes, literally. Which is why it's incredibly dangerous to come this far from the outpost. Survival in a forest is difficult enough without teleporting wolves to deal with. You must be stupid, because there are far, far easier ways of committing suicide than this. Emily takes a moment to figure out how to respond to this. I know it was stupid, I just got a little carried away. This place is so beautiful. 
By the time I realized how far I'd gone, it was too late. Got some great shots, though. <laughs> she holds up her camera and laughs half-heartedly. The knight doesn't appear impressed. She continues. You're... Wait, I've heard about you. Oh my god, you're the Red Knight! Holy shit, I didn't even think you were real. I just thought you were some kind of fairy tale or s story one of the old people came up with. To, like, convince us we're not completely fucked or something, but Jesus Christ, you're actually real! He walks past her. Sabatons clanking quietly on the soft forest earth. As real as daisies. Follow me, I'll show you back to town. She trots after him, still in a daze. The two walk through the trees, which are as quiet and tranquil as they usually are. She can't help but notice the falling leaves are almost the exact same color as the knight's cape. So, I'm sure you know I have to ask you some questions. He sighs. Yes, I had girded myself for the eventuality. Are you going to answer them? I have nothing to hide. You have until we reach the camp to ask as many questions as you can. I'm afraid I won't be staying. Why not? Work to do. What work? You may remember how I saved you from wolves a few moments ago. That kind of work. Right, the uh, saving people thing. I've met a couple people who say they've met you. They probably have. You can, like, do magic, right? Teleport and stuff. I already know you're, uh, you've got, like, superpowers, basically. The knight raises a gauntlet, and a scattering of bright white sparks flash around it. For a moment. I wouldn't call it magic, exactly. I'm not sure magic exists. I just bend the rules a little. Right. So, I feel like I have to ask the question everyone else wants to ask you. God, they're gonna be so jealous. Uh, why? Why with the saving people and everything? I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth or anything. None of us are. It's just that you're not exactly the standard Backrooms experience. Backrooms? Yeah, that's our, uh, word for all of this, I guess. The knight looks around at the forest surrounding them. Little more than just a series of rooms, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of is. The name just stuck, I think. That's clever, you know? How you dodge questions like that. But not this time, bucko. What's the deal? Come on, I'm trustworthy. I save people because it's what I was made to do. It is quite literally my purpose in life. I realize that might sound cliche, but there are parts of the universe where things like that are more than just words. You yourself may feel that you have some kind of role that keeps you moving forward. An obligation. This is mine. Emily looks at her camera. Well, I'm a photographer. But I wouldn't say I do that out of a sense of obligation. It's a passion. I do it because I want to, not because I have to. And I suppose there's a distinction. So you don't want to save people? The knight lets a brief silence hang. It's not as simple as that. It never is, but I believe people should do what their heart tells them, not what other people tell them. You should do what makes you happy. People aren't made with directives, like robots or something. Robot? Yeah, like a machine that only has a single job and mindlessly does it. No sentience or agency. Hmm. Well, Emily, then I might just not be a person. I might be one of these robots. Emily balks. Yeah, I guess, but you don't really seem like one to me. No? No. You, like, have... You seem pretty alive. And you have a personality. Kind of. So these machines are defined by a lack of personality. Pretty much. They're not people. They're just machines made to resemble people and do the labors that people don't want to do. I'll be honest with you. That does sound a lot like me. I was made for a purpose. To do something that others couldn't do. And when I fulfilled that purpose, there wasn't anything left. And in that absence, I just keep doing what I've always done. Over and over. It sounds... Parts of this sound a lot like... Her. You know, the blue angel. Note. See the enigmatic entity, Nostalgy Gaius. No, I don't think so. Another urban legend, kind of like you. She appears to people who are losing their way and pulls them out of the state they're in. But not literally like you do. It's like... It's a mental thing. 
I'm probably not describing it very well. I've never seen her, but I know a couple people who have. They were struggling with, like, depression, you know? Thinking about trying tying that last knot, if you know what I mean. But the blue angel appeared and pulled them out. I always assumed you were connected somehow. You've even got the opposite color thing going on. The knight is sure he knows what she's talking about, but he doesn't say. He avoids thinking of his sister. He wasn't made with the right skills to do anything for her. Her strength was beyond his to break, and she always resisted him. He wonders how her death has changed her, as his has done. No, it doesn't ring a bell, but this place is full of strange things. I can't pretend to have seen them all. Emily hops over a large root and comes around to face the knight directly. Okay, tell you what, we'll do a test. A test? Yes, to determine if you're a robot. Like that episode of Spongebob. First things first, can you feel love? Yes, I can. A somewhat disappointed look shadows Emily's face. And they keep walking. That was faster than I thought it was going to be. Well, uh, robots can't feel love or anything else. So, good news, buddy. You're no robot. Hmm. But, just so we're super clear on the issue, we can keep going. What do you care about? Robots don't care about shit. They just do their work and follow orders. I'm not sure. I don't think I've ever had to put it into words. No one's ever asked. No one who is genuinely interested, at least. Well, I'm interested. Think about it. What do you like? What makes you happy? What are the things that motivate you? What do you give a shit about? The knight is quiet for a long moment before giving his answer. I care about... Things moving forward. I like it when things struggle, but stay alive. And win against the things that are trying to kill them. I like it when things last. It makes me happy to see things change for the better, and not fall into stagnation. That miserable flat circle where nothing is ever different, and it all just decays into itself. The swamp of being. I... like it when things are not that. I like it when a flower blooms. I like it when predators get beaten by their prey. When the new cuts the chains of the old. When the past is smelted into the future. I care about... hope. Because lights go out if they are not tended, and death will reign if no one stands against it, even if they're small. There is another, heavier silence. The night depends. Sorry, that was maybe a little unprofessional. I just think about this kind of thing a lot, and, well, like I said, no one's ever asked. He looks back, to see that Emily has stopped walking. There's a look on her face that the knight ca can't quite place. She steps forward and embraces him, even though he's cold and steely. Then she lets him go, and nods ahead. In the distance are the firelights of her home. She sniffs. You're a... you're not a robot. Not even close. She raises her camera and memorializes his instant of realization forever. The girl and the primordial being part ways, but not for the last time, to the knight's eventual surprise. Though he wasn't aware of it in the moment, she had given him a lot to think about, and he was glad to see her again, to tell her of what she had helped him learn.